Welcome to the Star Commons and the first of the faculty programs that we've scheduled this week to celebrate uh, the new Goodson Library and the, and the Star Commons, the, the transformation of our law school. Uh, we have a great faculty at this, at this law school, and now we have um, a great commons in which to hear from our faculty and also to eat good food. Those two things go together, uh, very important. We all like food, and uh, it brings us together, but we also like uh, intellectual pursuits, and that's why we're here. We have a very distinguished group of uh, faculty members who have agreed to speak about intellectual property um, in the 21st century. And then through this entire week, uh, we'll have a set of, of equally distinguished, I was going to say equally if not more, but then I thought that wouldn't be a very nice thing to say, uh, faculty who will um, be speaking on other topics through the week. So please do come uh, through the week to, to celebrate uh, what we've built here and what we continue to build and what we do here. I turn the matter over now to our uh, Laddie professor, Artie Rye. So the topic of this panel is intellectual property in the 21st century, and you might be asking yourself, well, how relevant is intellectual property in the 21st century given that the economy is tanking and elections are right around the corner? Um, aren't we really focused on uh, perhaps bigger issues? I would argue, and I suspect some of my colleagues would argue, to the contrary, that innovation and creativity are going to be essential for reviving our economy in the long term. And fortunately, I think that both of our presidential candidates recognize that um, the salience of innovation and creativity, as some of you may have noted, the New York Times two weeks ago, I think in a, perhaps our first, devoted a full-length article to the innovation and creativity platforms of the Obama and McCain campaigns and um, praised them both for, for their attention to these issues. So I think that um, while uh, our focus is perhaps on the financial markets, and perhaps in, the, in that area there has been a little bit too much innovation and creativity. Um, in general, innovation and creativity do represent the key to a strong economy in the future, and I think our panelists will attest to, to those points. We will begin our panel by hearing from Professor James Boyle, who is the William Neal Reynolds Professor of Law at Duke, and he is the co-founder of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain. Professor Boyle's credentials are too numerous to enunciate in any short introduction, so I will just give you the briefest of, of glimpses of all that he has done. He's written um, numerous uh, uh, articles and numerous books as well, for that matter. He's on the board of almost every <laughs> public interest uh, copyright organization one could imagine. Um, and most recently, he has uh, finished, um, and it's about to come out, a book called The Public Domain, Enclosing the Commons of the Mind. Professor Boyle will speak about the musical public domain. There's, um, I guess, a a certain uh, simplicity and elegance to my topic. They say that talking or writing about music is like dancing about architecture. And I gather that the events of this week are actually supposed to be us dancing about architecture. So um, here we are in this beautiful space. And I'm going to talk about the way that law treats music um, and why we've gone fairly dramatically wrong um, in the way that we think about musical creation. Um, so much so um, that I think we will pay a massive cultural price. And of course, I can't exactly describe that cultural price to you because it consists of things that we won't have. Um, so it's kind of hard for you to get sad about it, since I say, oh, you won't have a genre of music that you've never heard of. Um, OK, that's hard to put a value on it. But I think I'll be able to make the point that we are uh, going in the wrong direction with the following relatively, I think, uncontroversial hypothesis. If they had been developed under our current set of rules for music, certainly jazz, arguably the, the blues, and most of rock and roll would be illegal. Um, that doesn't mean they wouldn't exist. Lots of illegal things exist. 
but it is unlikely that they would have been developed in the large-scale way that they were. That strikes me as an enormously bad thing, um, and actually particularly bad for the United States, which has contributed those particular genres um, to world culture. Okay, so um, not all of you have studied intellectual property, though I'm sure most of you are going to remedy that in the near future. Um, so you might wonder, how do we think about creativity and intellectual property? We have lots of, or actually three or four or five boxes uh, in intellectual property, and what we do when a form of culture or innovation comes along is we generally attempt to stuff it into one of those boxes uh, with greater or lesser degrees of violence. Um, uh, bits, it's rather like Procrustes' bed. Uh, bits sometimes kind of uh, hang over and they're lopped off or they're stretched. Violence is done to the uh, innovation in the process sometimes, sometimes not. But we work within those forms most of the time. The two obvious forms, two obvious boxes we have are patent and copyright. And they have fundamentally different assumptions about the way that creativity works. Patent assumes that creativity functions like a pyramid in a number of ways. First of all, it's assumed that multiple people around the world will converge on the same answer to a technical problem. How do I catch mice? How do I stimulate a coherent beam of light? So we only give a single patent and we give it to the first person who manages to come up with that innovation. And we think, in addition, that not only do they converge, but they are incrementally building on each other so that we need the second and third and fourth and fifth developers to have access to the work of the first developer and so on up the chain so that you can borrow and build on the work of those before. And we do that in a number of ways. We have short terms, only 20 years. Uh, we require publications so that people can look at it immediately uh, and a variety of other ways. We allow people to improve without getting a license and then have a, a, a series of rules which uh, allow them to negotiate uh, how to proceed with innovation. Copyright, if you had to generalize, proceeds on an entirely different assumption. Far from creativity being assumed to be a pyramid in which we all must build on the work of those before, copyright, in some of its salient aspects, assumed that creativity diverges. Copyright covers expression, original expression. And original expression is assumed, at least in many places without copyright, to be endlessly diverse and sometimes, although not always, to be the kind of thing that can happen in a flash of genius. It just comes to you, you come up with the novel out of thin air. Now, a lot of you are saying, but that's bogus. In fact, novelists build on prior genres and so forth. Yes, that's true, and copyright has some, um, has some built-in uh, fields to allow that. But the idea is that when I write my novel, I don't need to build on your novel, and I particularly don't need to grab huge chunks of it. Thus, copyright deals poorly with places where that assumption isn't true. For example, histori historical and literary biography, or software, right? In those cases, both covered by copyright, we in fact do need to build on the prior stuff, and what's worse, far from diverging so that every novel diverges from every other novel infinitely out into space, we instead find convergence. Software tends to become more similar, tends to look more and more like each other. What's the problem? Music and this will offend those of you who are musicians, I know, is very like software. It's very like software in a lot of ways. First of all, music is like software in that musicians specifically build on the work of those who come before and do so overtly. That's actually part of the tradition. Think of jazz, for example. Jazz is built on a series of conventions, but also a series of themes. There are literally thousands of jazz songs that were built on the Gershwin song, I Got Rhythm. Those chord changes in that song are so standard, they are referred to as the rhythm changes, and they are the basis for an enormous amount of jazz. And no fee was paid to Gershwin for all of those songs because it was assumed that that's what one did. You couldn't copy the entire song, but you could certainly take all of the chord sequences, and indeed, this was viewed as an homage, a tip of the hat to Gershwin. Well done for coming up with that chord sequence. In a number of ways that I'll sketch out very briefly, music has lost sight of this fact precisely because music in a number of ways doesn't fit copyright's boundaries. 
First of all, limited menus for expression, at least in the Western tradition. We have a limited number of notes on the scale, at which point it repeats. There are limited combinations of those notes that sound good together. What's more, genres make them converge even more tightly. If you work in rock or the blues, for example, you use a 1-4-5 chord progression. That means you're going to sound very like the last person. Now, if in each case you have to pay a licensing fee to the person before you, that's going to make this process almost impossible. You're saying, but surely that would never happen. Well, it shouldn't have happened, but increasingly it is. Why? There are a couple of reasons. Copyright's biggest hole, bigger than fair use by far, the biggest public domain-shaped hole in copyright is the fact that you cannot copyright ideas. You can only copyright the expression of those ideas. When I write a history book or a philosophical text, you can immediately take the ideas and use them all you want without paying me a fee uh, because the ideas go immediately into the public domain. Only the expression of them is there. What is the idea in a piece of music? The courts have looked at that and have shaken their head and thought, well, we think it's basically all expression, except for the most abstract thing. That's sad. The pathétique, for example, is sad. That's all we can say about it. So you don't get to own sad, but you get to own everything else, right? So immediately, copyright is actually covering more. And covering it at a more atomic level. There's an irony to the way that copyright works, which is, unlike patent, you get um, in the rule of independent creation, which means if I write Ode to a Grecian Urn and you, separated in time and space, not knowing me, write Ode on a Grecian Urn also, we each get a copyright in it, unlike the patent situation. You think, wow, well, that sounds good. That sounds as though then lots of people will be able to write the same song so long as they don't borrow from each other. Ironically, the way that this rule is applied, that's not the case. Why? Because of an asymmetry in the way that the courts analyze these issues, the person who takes music or is playing music that sounds like the prior version is subject to a set of rules that say where there's a striking similarity, we lower the burden for proving access, for proving that you copied it. Even though I can't say, I never heard that song before, I've never heard it, I didn't borrow it, I came up for it by myself, the courts have gone so far, at least in some circuits, as to say, that if they sound the same, we are going to assume that you copied it if there is any possible way that you could have had access. So for example, Michael Bolton, um, who uh, uh, composed a piece of music which sounded like an Isley Brothers uh, tune with the same name, um, the court said, well, when he was 25 years ago, when he was a teenager in New Jersey, we found a playlist of a radio station that played that song. Since he could have been in New Jersey and he could have been listening to that radio station, it is possible that he heard the song and therefore he had access, $5.4 million judgment against him. Right? So independent creation there is doing no work at all. On the other hand, when it comes to the person who actually has made the piece of music who's suing about it, you might say, hey, you know, there are a million people who've come up with that theme. I can find it in Beethoven, I can find it in Mozart, I can find it in soul music. Ah, there the courts say, well, we can presume independent creation, particularly where we're talking about the public domain. You know, maybe this person just came up with it by themselves. So when it comes to infringing the copyrights of existing artists, we don't apply this idea of independent creation when it comes to dealing with um, work which uh, has been in existence for many, many years, where there are lots of prior examples. We tend to assume, oh, well, actually, we'll give you a strong legal right. There's another major problem. The courts uh, have struggled with two conflicting visions about what copyright over music covers. One vision is this. This is from Arnstein versus Porter. The plaintiff's legally protected interest is not his reputation as a musician, but his interest in the potential financial returns from his compositions, which derive from the lay public's appro approbation of his efforts. The question, therefore, is whether the defendant took from plaintiff's work so much of what is pleasing to the ear of lay listeners that they wrongfully appropriated something. So what does that mean? What that means is the copyright is strongest over the hook, right? Over the little earworm of the song that goes into your ear. But it is that earworm that is most likely to hew to the demands of a particular genre or a particular tradition. So the more that people like it, the more likely it is to be covered by a property right. On the other hand, we have a, a conflicting line of cases which say, well, there are a limited number of musical permutations and a more limited number to, uh, uh, even than that, that are, quote, uh, attractive to the infantile demands of the popular ear. So 
that, that's, that's, that's us. Um, and thus, the fact that two things are similar shouldn't imply copyright viol uh, violation. We have these rules about genre protection, that you shouldn't be able to own the entire genre. Those two ideas are on a collision course. If the thing that you own is the thing that the public like most, and the fact that only a limited number of things are pleasing to the infantile demands of the popular ear, we have two contradictory ideas. The result, unfortunately, is the court has sided with the first and basically given extensive protection. It has got so bad that can, when you conjoin the legal rules with a new set of practices arising in the music industry, which is basically to license everything, that we are now at the point where even one, two, three, four note sequences are being licensed. And this has produced a dramatic change in the way music's made. Uh, if you listen to rap music uh, at all, you may have noticed that rap uh, in the 1980s would have thousands of samples. So NWA, for example. If you listen to rap now, and I don't, um, it's extremely boring, uh, largely because the samples that it takes are generally one or two which have been pre-screened and paid for. The old theory was, like the jazz trumpeter, who is quoting from a prior selection of songs in creating new things, that it's okay to sample from what went before. That's the nature of music, convergence. The new assumption is each musical set of notes that you take should be paid for. It's a pay-as-you-go system. So there is a possible out for all of this. And the possible out is the world that many of you live in, namely the world of YouTube mashups and remixes. You might say, how can you say this? Because actually, we've never seen more creativity in remix and addition in using these new digital tools um, to make music creatively, but also using prior music to comment on it and so forth. Well, not so fast. It's true that that is right now available and you can get it on YouTube, but it is not the kind of thing that you are going to be able to hear on any broadcast station, on any radio, or any television. Indeed, most of the popular remixes that you were sent by your friends, by email, you've got to check this out, are specifically legally barred from entering any mass media market because the samples haven't been cleared. You might say, well, what about fair use? My colleague Jennifer Jenkins, in an amazing study, looked at basically every fair use case decided on music. She found not a single example of fair use other than direct parody. So think of all the kinds of fair uses we make other than parody outside of music. Quotation, reference, criticism, satire, right? All of these things are types of fair uses. They basically never get claimed in music in musical copyright cases. So the thing that I fear is that far from this new technology uh, offering this wonderful uh, escape valve so that we can have creativity which allows remix without uh, infringing on, uh, without in impinging on the, the value of the public domain to subsequent creators, it will actually become simply a testing ground for what actually is commercially feasible. And then, to the extent that something is commercially feasible, we're going to see an immediate demand that everything be cleared, with the result that what actually happens is that the only thing that enters the mass uh, domain is a highly redacted form of creativity. In the book that I have just finished, I write about this, and I'll be talking about this in the law school in uh, later in November, uh, with specific examples uh, in soul music, in jazz, in rock, and in, in, in rap. But I think the most striking one is just to think of the process by which the blues and jazz were developed. A large communal effort produced a musical commons of themes, of hooks, of bass lines, of riffs. Artists took those. They were assumed all to be in the public domain. Copyright formalities, copyright didn't last a long time, and it wasn't used that much in the business anyway, except in blatant total copying of the whole thing. They took that raw material, which effectively or in reality was in the public domain, and they built things which they then profited from, and good, a good thing too. That world of this large public domain of musical creativity from which people drew to create their own things, which they then acquired copyrights over without diminishing that public domain, that world is increasingly vanishing. And what that means is while I can't tell you the names of the kinds of music we're foregoing, that the next jazz or rap or blues or soul will either not be formed or will be formed in a very different way than the traditions of our musical past, which strikes me as a great shame. Thanks very much. <laughs>
So next, continuing in the theme of copyright, we will have David Lang, who is the Melvin G. Shim Professor of Law at Duke, and he has been a member of our faculty since 1971. Um, he has also recently published a book, or Jamie's book is coming out soon. Um, Professor Lang's book has uh, just come out from Stanford University Press. It's co-authored with Professor Jeff Powell, who is also on the Duke faculty. And the title of the book is No Law, Intellectual Property in the Image of an Absolute First Amendment. And uh, Professor Lang will be talking about some of the uh, issues raised by his book. Thank you, buddy. Um, this book has just been shipped, I'm happy to say, um, last week. Now, I haven't received the book yet in my own hands, though, of course, I have a copy of it. In fact, I have many drafts of it. Um, and I suspect, I suspect if um, Stanford Press has behaved true to form, it's probably being shipped by some form of land delivery uh, on the back of a camel or possibly a turtle. But I am pleased that the book is on its way. It's a long book, and it was long in gestation, and I want to tell you a little bit about what we did in this book or tried to do and what our purpose was. Um, I'm not sure I can correct this. I may, if I just do that, can you hear me? And am I speaking loud enough to be heard in the back? Well, we'll, we'll try to make do. Some years ago, I guess it was in uh, roughly 2000, Jeff Powell and I, who are we're very close friends, we were talking one day about the very kinds of things that Jamie has just addressed so eloquently and so well. And I was lamenting, as I usually do, the very difficulties that he has outlined in the context particularly of music and the limitations that copyright imposes upon new creativity. And we said to ourselves, um, by the living gods, we really ought to write a book about this. Let's just write a short book that we can have done in a very short time. It will be in the nature of a polemic. We won't have any footnotes. Uh, I would say at the outside, counting even the time it takes us to get the contract, it shouldn't last more than three years. We'll be off and doing something else. Who knows how quickly? Well, that was, as I say, in 2000, and I think now in 2008, as we approach 2009 at last, that project has been finished. It's a very long book. It has many, many, many footnotes. It is, in a sense, for me, a kind of swan song. I, I think I shouldn't perhaps acknowledge that when David Levy, the dean, is here. But nevertheless, it is the culmination, in a sense, of all the things that I've had an opportunity to think about in the years that uh, I have been a lawyer in practice and teaching at the law school. And so it was, for me, a great effort of love and a great labor at the same time. Jeff was finished with his part of the book much more quickly than I, but I took my time and I did it partly because I wanted to be sure that everything that I had hoped to say, I would ultimately be able to say. And I did, much to the dismay of Stanford Press, which had hoped also for a short book and got instead a long one. Now, this is what we actually decided that we would say. We thought that intellectual property really ought to be, in some sense, circumscribed by the First Amendment in a way that was far more direct and complete than anything that we had seen at the point at which we began to work on the book. The history of the First Amendment and the, and the law of copyright is roughly this. Until about 1970, no one thought about the two as if in conflict at all. And then a professor who was uh, also a practitioner and also the world's foremost authority, really, on copyright, I think then without any doubt, and I would say, frankly, even now, um, his, his work, which survives him, he died in 1986, is still, I think, the leading single authority on the field. Melville Bernard Nimmer had asked in a speech to the Copyright Society of the United States whether copyright might possibly be seen as violative of the First Amendment. And he answered his question in this way. He said, if we look at copyright and we ask ourselves how it is that we justify a system of protection that has the effect of limiting rights in expression by granting exclusivity to authors, then if we take the First Amendment seriously, it's very difficult to know how one can avoid concluding that the First Amendment is in fact violated 
by copyright and violated in all of the important parts that copyright itself comprises. But, of course, Nimmer was, on the one hand, a First Amendment scholar of some note, but a, a copyright scholar of real preeminence. And he wasn't asking this question because he wanted to suggest that the First Amendment was, in fact, violated by the First Amendment, but rather in order to explain why it was not. And so he answered the question that he raised by saying, copyright doesn't violate the First Amendment for these reasons. Internally, he said, the copyright system offers us at least a couple of ways in which we can escape a collision, a real conflict with the First Amendment. On the one hand, there is this idea that Jamie has averted to, um, though it wasn't at the center of what he was talking about, but the idea of the, the, the idea-expression dichotomy. On the one hand, an idea. On the other hand, its expression. I just finished introducing copyright to my class this morning, and so I'll use what I already have said to them once. On the idea side of the line, we have the British spy. But on the expression side of the line, we have the martini drinking, shaken, not stirred, actually not shaken, the Aston Martin DB7 driving, the Walther PPK packing, the womanizing, the, the general raconteurism, raconteuring, I guess I should say, um, behavior of a spy who is licensed by Her Majesty's Secret Service to kill at will and who bears as evidence of his license to do so the designation 007. We've moved in that from one side to the other, from idea to expression. And the idea-expression dichotomy, we take as the reason why, one of the preeminent reasons why the First Amendment is not violated by the law of copyright. As long as the idea is free, Nimmer said, then it's not wrong and it doesn't have to be seen as violative of the First Amendment if we allow authors for some limited period of time in order to encourage them to create work to hold exclusive rights in that work. And what's more, he said, although he didn't really emphasize this quite as fully in his essay as I'm about to do in my remarks now, copyright also offers something called the fair use defense. Here again, something that Jamie's just talked about. As long as copyright offers us a right to quote, excerpt, deal in a fair use way with works that are otherwise under copyright, surely there can be no harm with respect to the First Amendment or under the First Amendment. Now, you may ask if you've read the First Amendment recently, but doesn't it say Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech or of the press? And if that's how you remember the First Amendment, you will actually be right. It does say exactly those things. It says a little more, but we don't have to think about them just now, and surely, if it says that no law shall be made that abridges the expression, then surely no law ought to be made. Well, Nimmer said, not quite so fast. The problem, you see, is that when we deal with the First Amendment, we're dealing with a system of balances, an exquisite system of balances in which we define what is protected by balancing the interests. And although that isn't itself precisely the test that we still use today, not quite 40 years later. It's close enough. Still today, we use a hierarchy of balancings, balances in assessing whether or not a given interest does or does not find itself abridged by a congressional rule when Congress chooses to pass it. Meanwhile, the court, though it has never addressed the question of the First Amendment and copyright together in an absolutely direct, square, plenary way, has said in a very broad passage in a case decided in 2003 that so long as copyright is traditionally configured, which is to say offers us the idea expression dichotomy that we are accustomed to and offers us the fair use defense and a few other things that I won't trouble you to, with details of at the moment, as long as copyright is like that, then there really isn't any conflict with the First Amendment. So that's the background against which Jeff and I were talking, and we thought, we really don't think that system is a good system. I don't think the system is a good system. I don't think it's a good system on either side. I don't like the copyright system for the very reason that Jamie has addressed, I think, so very well. The inroads that copyright makes into our ability to create and to express ourselves, I think, are very serious and very grave. They represent not just an affront to the public domain in a larger sense, but I think also a more focused affront to the First Amendment as well. 
But I will have to say that Nimmer's argument was a powerful one, an argument that I think has to be taken note of so long as we read the First Amendment the way he read it, or so long as we read the First Amendment the way we read it even still today. Well, you can imagine what Jeff and I decided to do. We decided to propose that we read the First Amendment in a different way. Justice Black, when he sat on the bench from 1937 to 1971, was, among other things, a proponent of what he called the absolute rule of the First Amendment. He said, no law means no law, and it means that there are no ifs, ands, or buts, or whereases about the rule that the First Amendment embodies. The rule is that Congress is not free to make a law that abridges freedom of expression. My students will tell you that I always have to be careful about the watch, because otherwise I'll hold you over the hour, and I don't mean to do that. Jeff and I said, you know, if we wrote a book that really reflects what we think, not only would we want to reform copyright in its own present iteration, but we'd also probably want to do it by proposing that the First Amendment be read as an absolute. So what we set out to do in a massive act of temerity and chutzpah was to write a book in which we proposed two things at once that the First Amendment would now be read as an absolute, that no law would mean no law, that we would move from balancing to definition. Now, that's not as easy and as straightforward as you may imagine. It's very well to speak in terms of moving from a definition or from a balance to a definition. It's one thing to propose it and another thing to pull it off, but we would be moving in the right direction, and so that was a part of our book. And the other part of our book was to ask what would happen to intellectual property in its expressive parts, and they're not limited to copyright, though copyright is clearly at the center, what would happen to its expressive parts if the First Amendment were read as an absolute? To my surprise, it's why, in part, it took me as long as it did to really think my way through it. I came to the conclusion that a good deal of what we recognize as protectable in copyright, we might actually be able to salvage. We might, for example, be able to grant exclusive rights in streams of actual profits from a work, but we would not be able to go on supporting the kind of exclusivity that we have accustomed ourselves to recognizing in the case of copyright. And we wouldn't because the First Amendment would now actually say with respect to exclusivity and expression, no law means no law. Well, you say, and well you might. How practical is that suggestion? Let me tell you that it's impractical altogether if by practical you mean do I think it has any likely purchase in the near future. But one thing I learned a number of years ago is that if you can bring yourself to write what you think and what you believe as an academic, having the freedom to do so as we do, then it is amazing what can follow. Some years ago, I wrote an essay that I thought would have no note, be taken no note of at all about the public domain in which I proposed, and I think in this at least, I did propose something that had not been proposed before, that we think of the public domain as a kind of affirmative thing beyond merely what was left over after the doctrines had finished nibbling at the trough, but something to be taken affirmative account of itself. To my surprise, that became the subject of a discourse that's now quite lively and gone way beyond anything that I'm much involved in any longer. Do I think the same thing will happen with the First Amendment? Well, of course not. I mean, lightning may strike once, but not twice. Is it worth writing a work of this kind? I tell you I think it is, because if we do not have and do not exercise the freedom to say what we actually think, if we are not free, as Tacitus said, to speak as we think and think as we please, then I would actually find this a very dreary business. I've never enjoyed coloring inside the lines. I've always liked coloring outside the lines, and it isn't because I think coloring outside the lines is in itself necessarily a good thing. Much, I'm sorry to have to confess, of what I actually think is in my own assessment after the fact very often quite foolish, even stupid. But to be able to think freely strikes me as a very good thing nevertheless, because once in a while you might possibly be right. I hope that when we speak about reimagining intellectual property, in at least its expressive manifestations, in the image of an absolute First Amendment, as we do in the book that has been shipped now.
and I'm sure that you will all have copies of. They cost $79 in the hardcover edition, but you can get them for $29 uh, in the softcover edition. When you have the book in your hand, I hope you will agree that it's a, a proposal that you earnestly wish to join us in advocating. Thank you very much. I think it's fair to say that all of the members of this panel color outside the lines, and our last speaker is no exception to that rule. Our last speaker will be Jerome Reichman, who is the Bunyan S. Womble Professor of Law at Duke. Uh, Professor Reichman is a leading expert in the area of international intellectual property. He has written more on the so-called TRIPS agreement than I could ever possibly read. Um, and he serves as an advisor to numerous, numerous international intellectual property bodies um, that advocate in particular the interests of developing countries. Professor Reichman is going to speak on, um, this is a, as usual for Professor Reichman, a mouthful of a title, Rethinking the Role of Clinical Trial Data in International Intellectual Property Law. And there was actually a colon and more after that, but I convinced him to lop off the 100 words after that. Thank you, Professor Rai. Uh, it's a great honor to be here opening the, the week of a dedication of this uh, important part of our building. I think it's a wonderful feat that we have it, and uh, we all, somebody who was speaking to us, uh, to the faculty last week as a, as a law professor somewhere else said, gee, it doesn't look like the school that I went to. So we, we have come a long way. Uh, I should also like to point out that um, <clears throat> Professor Rai and I are about to launch a first draft of, a, of a, an article about uh, asking whether patents will help or hurt climate change, the quest for climate change technology for the Royal Institute of National Affairs in England. And I, I suppose it'll be controversial, although we'll hope to tone it down in keeping with our colleagues' examples. <laughs> um, I want to talk about a subject that on the edge of patents that you probably uh, have never even heard about what is clinical trial data. You, you really only come across it in the, in the papers, but increasingly uh, you hear about it more and more, and little that you hear is good. These are the results of the tests that companies make to, find, to, to establish for marketing approval whether a potential drug <coughs> meets uh, uh, the FDA standards of safety and uh, efficacy. And as we have been seeing in case after case in the last five to 10 years, uh, with growing uh, uh, repetit uh, repetitiveness, the um, bad results are suppressed, uh, the findings are skewed, uh, bad side effects are, are not released, and terrible things happen. The most recent case of Zedia, for example, uh, in which uh, it, it turned out that it was actually hurting rather than helping um, uh, heart patients. So, if you think about this, why should this trend be so surprising? Clinical trials cost enormous amounts of money. I'll speak a little bit about that in a minute. And the costs are rising so fast that uh, we think they are actually unsustainable over time. And if you think about it, uh, uh, a negative outcome will sink an entire research project, which uh, from lab to trial may entail uh, uh, a loss of millions or even a billions of dollars. So, you, you may start to suspect there's a moral hazard here. If the pharmaceutical companies pay for the tests and conduct the tests, they have a perverse incentive to paint the end results in the rosiest possible light. Uh, now, to help them cover the costs, what you may not know, and indeed, uh, I've been working on this topic now for uh, maybe uh, eight years, but it still, it still astonishes me to discover it. They have lobbied successfully <coughs> Uh, from the, uh, for relief from the burden of uh, recouping the cost of clinical trials in the form of a backdoor uh, intellectual property right known in the United States as marketing exclusivity and in the European Union as uh, data exclusivity. Uh, what we mean by that is that uh, apart from the patent, uh, they obtain anywhere from three to ten years of additional protection uh, for the uses of the data itself. Um, and uh, the net effect when it kicks in is that a competitor cannot mark a generic drug, uh, regardless of the patent status, it may be off patent or not, until uh, 
the uh, uh, data exclusivity period, the market exclusivity period, is, uh, uh, is over. Of course, in principle, the competitor could conduct one's own clinical trials. That is generally thought to be unethical. You're repeating the, uh, the risks on people who need the drug. But more than that, it's uh, uh, impossible. The costs are prohibitive. Uh, so no one, ever, uh, no, no one ever repeats the trials. Generic, in, uh, generic uh, competitors must rely on the positive results of the first uh, trial, and they must show bioequivalence, that we have the same thing. <clears throat> but, in fact, uh, uh, increasingly, uh, they can't do this because um, uh, uh, the data exclusivity regimes have become increasingly dominant as an additional intellectual property layer of protection. I'm quoting that from uh, the head of the generic industry in Europe, uh, which blocks generic competition even with respect to second indications and other variations that uh, uh, are not even innovative enough to gain uh, patent protection. Uh, now, you, you, if you are surprised to learn how deeply rooted these alternative, uh, let's call them sui generis or uh, 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 specialized data exclusivity regimes have become in the United States and the European Union, notwithstanding the um, uh, amount of patent protection, which, you, which we're always talking about up front and which is supposed to be uh, 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 covering this uh, area, then you may be further surprised to learn that uh, in the last 10 years, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, with the help of the United States Trade Representative, has been exporting clinical uh, trial data exclusivity regimes from the developed countries to the developing countries, where you may well imagine the effects are potentially uh, disastrous, uh, because they further retard the possibility of entering the market with the, uh, drugs that uh, at prices people can afford or at prices they can get at all. Now, having said that and having expressed the, the, the implicit criticism of this practice uh, as, uh, as I do up front, I do want to look on the other side <clears throat> and assure you that the costs of clinical trials are egregiously high. Um, uh, the figures are disputed. Uh, some NGOs say, well, you could do most of those trials for 150 to 200,000. Our own, uh, one of our own uh, experts at Duke, econ economic experts, was in a, a famous study um, in which they estimate that the cost of clinical trials is about 800 million to a billion per successful drug. Now, those prices take into account what? The failures of the drug cost, uh, the, the, the four out of five that actually don't make it to market, and uh, uh, the, the growing costs of the, uh, uh, conducting the trials themselves, which uh, c continues to outstrip the consumer price index. The, uh, between uh, 1977 and 1995 alone, the bird uh, burden of data production increased by 43% in mean number of pages per new application, by 37% in mean number of patients uh, per new, uh, new drug application, and by 44% in mean number of clinical trials per uh, uh, accepted marketed drug. So uh, that comes out to at least 11% a year, plus the cost of money uh, and the, 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 the risk premium uh, uh, adds up to, uh, at the top of the scale, 800, to, uh, 800 million to a billion dollars, at the bottom of the scale, maybe two, three hundred thousand dollars, depending if the government has contributed to it or not. And the private sector is, of course, bearing these costs. Now, uh, what has happened, as I said a moment ago, is that the private sector has convinced the government to uh, push for international protection of clinical trial data as a separate entity, independent of and over and above patent protection. Um, the drive for uh, international, for global protection started with the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1992. Uh, where pretty stiff provisions were adopted with Canada and Mexico, um, um, uh, which was supposed to be a blueprint for the TRIPS agreement. The TRIPS agreement is the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property, uh, otherwise known as Annex 1C of the agreement establishing the World Trade Organization 1994. These are the universal rules binding on 155 countries of uh, um, international intellectual property protection and subject to enforcement by uh, international tribunals at the... Uh, uh, WTO. Uh, during the TRIPS agreement, the United States pressed for its NAFTA provisions and uh, tried to go even higher. The goal, what was the negotiating goal? The goal was uh, to outlaw 
the ability of a country to rely on the pre-existing findings uh, as a form of uh, illegal activity. Um, uh, it isn't a matter of actually consulting the data. That was actually outlawed at, uh, the TRIPS, by the TRIPS agreement in Article 39.3. The question is, could a country rely on the outcomes of the data, or would that be a form of so-called um, uh, unfair use or misappropriation, and could that be barred? Uh, they, uh, the United States and the European Union failed to obtain that uh, 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 degree of protection in the TRIPS agreement. What emerged was a fairly soft provision. It's called the misappropriation approach, meaning literally governments cannot show the data, cannot allow their, their private sector access to the data itself, but does not impede them from granting market approval, marketing approval based on bioequivalence and the literature. However, the pharmaceutical industry, the originator of the pharmaceutical industry, was not satisfied with this result. And um, they also found that they could not go any farther at the multilateral level, either at the WTO or at the World Intellectual Property Organization, because uh, 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 very significant uh, coalitions uh, uh, seeking to rebalance intellectual property rights in public health have been formed and have been increasingly successful. So uh, as many have observed, including um, Professor Okediji, uh, the response of the technology exporting countries was to shift the negotiating efforts to regional and bilateral trade agreements, where uh, you have the powerhouse market of the United States against uh, small markets who uh, will apparently give up anything to get access to uh, our market, and this through the access of the three free trade agreements. Now, uh, in, in thinking about this, you, you do want to understand that uh, there was a very great difference between the free trade agreements and the, uh, the state of knowledge that developing countries possessed um, at the time of the TRIPS agreement, uh, the negotiations of the TRIPS agreement. They weren't focused on intellectual property, they didn't understand it, and they weren't well represented. Uh, the opposite is true now. They have the best lawyers that money can buy, they sometimes have better lawyers than money can buy, and uh, they know exactly what they're doing, and they're much better negotiators than USTR, which simply take their marching orders from pharma. Uh, the problem is that uh, there are no negotiations on the intellectual property components of the free trade agreements. They are put to one side and then put forward as take it or leave it propositions. And the uh, cabinets, the, 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 the uh, uh, health ministers resign and other ministers uh, take poison. But the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the prime minister and his cabinet will normally sign these agreements no matter what they contain. So we find in them, for example, <coughs> Linkage clauses, which can prevent the regulatory authorities from granting approval to a generic version of a drug without the approval of the patent holder. So the regulatory authorities, which know nothing about patents, are then converted into de facto patent offices, which have to keep uh, 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 generic uh, drugs off the market for ever lengthening periods of time, first five years, then 10 years, whether they, there are any patents there or not. In many cases, uh, the patents, there are no patents in these countries, especially for existing drugs, but they have to keep them off the market anyway because of these free trade, free, these free trade agreements. Um, with each success, as each country caved, uh, without coordinating their position, the next country was sub uh, subjected to different demands, longer demands, so that now there is, in some of them, a waiting period where uh, uh, a country can actually uh, uh, register the drug at home, wait five years to go on the market, and then expect anywhere from five to ten years uh, uh, on the market uh, before uh, regulatory approval will be granted to a competitor. So you can see the effects this is having, and there's uh, also the possibility that uh, the, the uh, regulatory approval uh, adversely affects the ability of a state to issue compulsory licenses, even in cases of emergency. So this has become extremely, uh, extremely controversial, extremely contentious, and is creating an enormous amount of bad will. Now, I, I do believe there was a missed opportunity to counteroffer uh, I'll just mention it in passing because I, I cannot speak publicly at Duke without speaking about liability rules. That wouldn't be it wouldn't be possible. But there there was there was a, a possibility uh, in our own law. We have a uh, something called FIFRA, which deals with pesticides and agricultural products. We do have a regime in which, uh, after a certain period of time, anyone can use the data and pay a reasonable royalty. So uh, pretty early on, I, I saw where these things were going, and I just said, you're going to lose. <laughs> so you should really counter offer with a, uh, uh, a so-called uh, royalty, reasonable royalty or a cost-sharing approach. Uh, 
uh, we would call it a liability rule. And since this, and, and the earliest American international proposal actually raised this possibility. Here I think the developing countries made a huge mistake. Uh, they overestimated their bargaining power they, uh, and they didn't take it, uh, even though the leading NGOs in the field immediately came out and endorsed the cost sharing alternative. Uh, they thought that they could just rely on the fact that these, these costs are supposed to be covered by patents, so why do you need something else? Uh, and instead, they have lost in one uh, round after another. Uh, the good news is that in a recent <coughs> agreement between the EFTA countries, the small group of uh, trading countries in Europe and Korea, uh, a cost-sharing approach has been uh, incorporated into that trade agreement, and EFTA is using a cost-sharing uh, cost approach in all of its negotiations. Uh, with uh, Asian countries, and there are reports that India, which is uh, resisting exclusive property right in uh, uh, data, is uh, also considering a cost-sharing approach. We will see. Now, <clears throat> recently, there's been a lot of literature about this, which was not the case a few years ago, and uh, the literature has begun to examine, well, why do we do this? <laughs> what, is it an incentive? Is it a reward? And there's some very interesting theories about it. Uh, I call this the flawed logic of market exclusivity. Um, uh, by and large, it's my view that you are getting double compensation uh, uh, that is unmerited. Uh, however, even though I am critical and have not time to go into uh, the uh, uh, incentive rationale, there, it, it has some legs because uh, more and more there are uh, uh, um, uh, 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 improvements that uh, for one reason or another don't qualify for patent and yet do entail enormous expenditures for clinical trials and which would obtain no uh, compensation for those clinical trials at all uh, um, without um, uh, some form of uh, protection. And then Rebecca Eisenberg, a famous colleague of ours at uh, Michigan University, has launched a, 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 a new theory of so-called uh, regulatory reward that this is uh, not really intellectual property right or a new kind of intellectual property right uh, in which you are to encourage the best of all possible clinical trials uh, by giving this reward. Uh, we are clearly getting the worst of all possible clinical trials. I'm very skeptical of the reward theory. Uh, but uh, if you think about it, there are some legs to the possible incentive theory, especially if, the, if we push this drive for quality patents. Uh, that means there will be more and more small improvements, which often have big payoffs. Sometimes they're just used to evergreen the drug, but sometimes they, a small improvement has a big uh, delivery payoff. Uh, uh, they will not get patents under a higher non-obvious standard, and there is some, uh, some legs, limited legs, to incentive rationale. So then I ask two questions. Well, if that's true, <laughs> it, it raises two fundamental uh, questions. Should we be giving exclusive property rights if we need some further compensation? And second of all, should we be having the private sector uh, do uh, this, uh, uh, conduct these trials at all? And uh, the answer to both is no. Uh, you're not increasing, uh, you're not contributing any advance in knowledge to the world. Therefore, you have no basis for an intellectual property right. The most you can justify whenever you're talking about protecting investment as such is a liability rule, a, a non-exclusive license. And then second of all, the deepest and biggest question is, should this private sector be conducting these trials at all? Are we not really talking about a public good? Are clinical trials not really a public good, a non-rivalrous good? And we are uh, uh, wrongly saddling the private sector with this responsibility, in which case the private sector always undersupplies a public good. So uh, we published here a few, a year ago, uh, Anthony So from the Public Policy School, um, Tracy Lewis from Fuqua and myself published a very short version about why clinical trials should be treated as a public good. I haven't time, we have really thought it through. It, it, it sounds simple, but we have really thought through the problems, including uh, uh, revenue neutrality, uh, competitive bidding, and so on. That appeared in Stiglitz's uh, uh, um, economist voice in the, in, the, in the expurgated version, the 1500 word version, which has been downloaded some 750 times at this point and it has generated a literature. What we didn't, weren't able to publish was the refined, longer 4,000-word version, which we really worked this out. So I have made that the final part of this article, and we'll circulate that. So I thank you for your attention. Think about it. Uh, I don't have time to defend the public good thesis now, but I hope the article does. <laughs> well, Jerry, I don't think you'll necessarily get away this quickly, because there will be questions, and you may be forced to defend your thesis. 
this is the time, unfortunately, not as much time as we'd like, but this is the time when we can take questions from the floor, and I would encourage those of you who have them to ask them and direct them to the speaker, um, identify the speaker to whom they're directed. Well, if you don't have questions, perhaps, oh, Matt? No? All right. Anyone? Um, if you don't have questions, um, perhaps I shall ask a question, and this is probably to all three panelists. Um, one of the um, reasons why Duke is famous or perhaps notorious is that all of its intellectual property faculty, I think, um, can fairly be configured on one end of the strong versus weaker intellectual property rights debate. Um, and this is a question really intended for all three of you. What would it take um, in terms of the configuration of the law um, of intellectual property for any of the three of you to think that we have reached an acceptable balance? Um, and if you can you know, state that in, in a few minutes, that would be useful. For my part, I, I think mine is very um, boring and conservative. I actually think that if we went back to what was effectively the law and practice of the 1970s, uh, which was hardly you know, an anarchist or anti-property reality, it was a reality with a vigorous copyright uh, system, um, that that would be um, excellent. I think that um, in particular, in the musical context, there are a few things that just need to be um, fixed. I think that the courts um, have not managed to rationalize their distaste for new musical forms of borrowing with their assumptions. I mean, federal district court judges are never going to sit there and say that jazz is illegal uh, because jazz is traditional, it's what they listen to on the radio, it's whatever. But they are going to, when they see an unfamiliar form of borrowing, they're going to say, well, this sounds to me like theft, though the same arguments would apply, mutatis mutandis, to the older cultural forms. So the, I actually think a relatively simple set of adjustments, which would include a clarification of what's called the de minimis rule, the amount that one can borrow without it actually counting as copying, which I think could be made more ex uh, expansive, a clarification by the courts that fair use went beyond parody in the musical context, um, a better understanding of the rules of genre, so that you're not supposed to be able to own a genre, and the courts continue to say that, but then they effectively allow people to control basic building blocks, basic musical intervals, for example, which effectively then give control over genre. I think that a combination in each of these areas where we simply said, um, this is the way that, you, you can certainly have a copyright over your song, and you should be protected against somebody who simply takes the entire thing and reproduces it. Um, which was actually the way that the law largely worked uh, in most cases, uh, sort of pre the, pre the 70s and before. Uh, there were certainly counterexamples, but I think that was the, the main. And I think simply returning to that would be a return to sanity. Um, I think what's actually happening in the business, particularly the business side, not even what the law actually says, which I think is bad, but the business side is much worse. The business side is simply to assume that any time there is value, then payment must follow. And that's simply the way that intellectual property has never worked, right? That's, that's, that's the opposite. So I think I'm fairly boring on this one. Professor Lane Reichman? Well, I'm sure that I'm fairly boring on this subject. My students uh, make that clear almost every day. But um, <laughs> I, what I would say to you, Artie, is that um, balance doesn't really fit the way I think about this subject right now, if you're asking about the First Amendment. My proposal actually is that balance is exactly what's wrong with the way we approach the First Amendment. I want to approach it instead through a new understanding of what it means to define as opposed to balance uh, First Amendment rights. That said, there are some things about copyright that I would find unobjectionable. Uh, were they to continue, they become complex quickly, but I can simplify them, I think, in this way. I have no objection at all to continuing to give those who are judged to be the originators of work that we continue to say is protected by copyright. A stream of royalties measured by the actual net gains that that work may uh, secure in the marketplace. 
This is a little different from the way Jerry ordinarily thinks about the, the, the liability regime. It's not exactly the same as the standard compulsory license. Uh, and it isn't something that I originated. I actually was impressed without realizing it some years ago when a professor who had been here and with whom I became a good friend, Jed Rubenfeld, now at Yale, and then at Yale too, but visiting here, um, suggested in a fairly short article that was a companion of a sort to one that I had written in the same time frame, that it wouldn't be objectionable under the First Amendment if we awarded net revenues as opposed to revenues in an a priori way, which is normally the kind of thing that we uh, think about when we think about a liability regime or a compulsory license. I actually didn't agree and don't agree now with everything that Jed said about that, but I do think that if you took what he said and modified it somewhat, that it would work, in my view, quite satisfactorily. It would mean that, for example, if you were the author of a novel, um, and you were an author of the novel in an ordinary way, that is to say, essentially the way we now think of authorship of novels, and I wanted to take your novel and turn it into a motion picture. To the extent that I recognized, realized net gains from my appropriation of your work, I think I could be required without any, um, uh, any um, violation of the First Amendment, as I see it, required to give you what amounted to the value of your work in my work on the basis of those net revenues. I, I wouldn't have any real problem with doing that. But otherwise, I think that balance is the very thing that I think is anathema, anathema uh, in the present system, and so I would not be interested in, in reaching a balance. I want to just add one thing, Artie, because it deserves to be said in a gathering of this kind. What that means is I do not care, actually, whether this is the proposal that I'm suggesting is economically efficient or viable or defensible in the ordinary sense, because that isn't actually what I think the First Amendment is about. And in that sense, again, I want to emphasize balance is not what I'm looking for. Um, That's, it actually raises an interesting question about what the goal of intellectual property is to, again, take it one step beyond the individual presentations. Is it an economic goal, or are there other goals to be satisfied through an intellectual property as well? Uh, Professor Reichman. Well, a small aside, uh, uh, what you have described is pretty much what I think about liability rules, so maybe there's some static that we have to clear up. But, um, uh, I, I, you know, I've written a lot of, about science, the imp impact of uh, intellectual property on science with a colleague of mine at the National Academy, Paul Euler, and we were thinking about it again this weekend, and uh, Jamie is certainly right that uh, if you go back uh, to the period in the 1970s, uh, the copyright law of the United States was extremely science-friendly, uh, and even more so than other countries in that all government-generated uh, data and uh, creations were by our own desire, not by copyright law, made part uh, uh, of the public domain from the time on. And all of that changed. And if you look around what the, the history of the changes are, they're constantly moving these intellectual property rights, which uh, do a lot of good in downstream applications at the commercial stage with creating some new problems pushing them further and further upstream where they protect stuff that was previously in the scientific commons or in the music commons uh, or in uh, all other kinds of commons. And this is creating havoc and will, in fact, stifle uh, whatever, fill in the gap, science, music, uh, uh, any kind of art, any kind of creative activity. Uh, uh, the notion, and, and this is actually one of the fundamentally wrong postulates of the current European Green uh, Paper, uh, is to only look at uh, uh, the static notion of what the IP does today with this existing uh, uh, innovation without thinking about how you got this existing innovation and how you will need the existing innovation tomorrow. Uh, as a result of that, uh, science has to manage increasingly its own data supplies, its own material supplies, um, uh, and that is constructive and helpful through contract. It has to contractually uh, reconstruct research uh, commons, but uh, it's having enormous deleterious effects. So we, we, the, the most important thing, as in our financial sector, uh, uh, and as Jamie has so eloquently said in the Financial Times only recently, uh, the notion that uh, markets are bad or that government is bad is really obsolete. You, you need uh, markets uh, uh, work because they're regulated in a certain, pre-regulated in a certain way, 
these are markets for literary, artistic, and uh, knowledge goods generally. We have to get the public goods back into knowledge is a public good, as Joe Stiglitz had said. We have to recognize that. We have to defend the diffusion of knowledge as a public good, while at the same time making sure that this transnational system of innovation that emerged from the TRIPS agreement really works at the downstream stage and doesn't gum up the works at the upstream stage. I leave it at that. Well, thanks to all of you. I know Professor Boyle has to run off and teach a class on intellectual property, I take it, no less. Um, legal theory, actually. Right, legal theory. Oh, well. <laughs> um, so I appreciate all of your attending, and uh, uh, thank you.